Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners, and I thank you for giving us some of your time every week. Today, I have Nicolette Harris. She is an end-of-life doula, which is something new to me, and so I wanted to talk to her about what she does and share it with you. So thanks for joining me, Nicolette. Hi, and it's Amelia Nicolette, actually, that I'm going by, but um, I appreciate it. I appreciate being on the podcast and chatting with you. My dog wants to bark now suddenly. <laughs> I could relate. My my listeners know I've got two golden retrievers. We had three. Yeah. I ended up recording in the closet in our old house because that was the quietest place I could get. <laughs> Now, yeah. I, the, now I have an entire office converted to a recording studio, so it's lovely. But they can still get a little bit noisy. We just have a 10-year-old that moved across the hall, and my dog hates children. Mm. So it's <laughs> anytime they're in the hall doing something, she's like over it. <laughs> That's funny. Dogs are mm -hmm. such interesting creatures. Really so are. tell us a little bit about yourself and how, how you got into being an end-of-life doula, and then we'll, I'll ask some questions about what it is you actually do. Sure. So um, I, it's, it's kind of interesting. I always say that it sort of fell in my lap, this whole industry and this, you know, experiences that I've had kind of led me to this path. Um, when I was 18, um, a sister of mine ended up in the hospital for a while and she had a really major heart surgery and amongst many other procedures done while she was there, and she needed a caregiver to stay with her. So I was fresh out of high school and needed something to do. So I went to stay with her um, while she was in the hospital. And I actually just totally fell in love with the experience. She was in the cardiac unit where the majority of the clients there are elderly, um, people that are in their 90s and up. And many of them didn't have visitors was the number one thing I noticed that I was the only visitor that it was ever there. Um, I probably bumped into a couple every now and then, and it was normally like resource managers and stuff. So I kind of fell in love with the experience, went back home with her and took care of her for a while. And then when I returned to my hometown, she was living in San Diego. When I returned to my hometown, um, my friend messaged me and she said, Hey, you know, we're hiring at this nursing home that I work at would you be interested in working here? I know you just did some like a stint in the hospital because <laughs> I was there for a few months. So I was like, yeah, I would, I, I think that'd be cool. Like I would like to come and check that out. So I started working at a little super shady care facility in my hometown. Um, we had usually about 12 residents at a time and all of them were on hospice. So that was my first real, uh, experience with a few different things. My first experience with elderly people, because I don't really have folks in my family that have lived very long. Um, people tend to pass pretty young. Uh, my grandma's getting up there these days, so good for her. But she's kind of the only one so far that I've been able to experience that with. So it was interesting being at that age and seeing it in person and kind of having a grandparent and like all of these different experiences that I never really got. And then losing them. I, it was such a weird, you know, you fall in love with this person and this experience with them and you meet somebody and it's a different version of this human, you know, their families don't even recognize them, but you know them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my first one that passed away was actually on Christmas Eve and mm -hmm. he was young. He was in his sixties and, um, a fireman and he had a brain injury and, mm. So it it was interesting because I learned a lot about hospice right away. I was training and working alongside a nurse named Marie at the time. Um, she was amazing. And I I still think about all the time just how like she had such etiquette and elegance about her and grace and everything that she did when she worked with our, our residents. And I remember once this woman was really upset, the woman of the wife of the man that passed away on Christmas Eve, she was really upset when he first came in and the nurses that worked with the hospice team were trying to comfort her and told her that he has about three months. Don't stress about it. You know, you have time to visit with him and things like that. 
And after she left, they all told me that he's got maybe a month. And I remember thinking, why would you tell her three months then? Like, that's horrible. Why would you say that? You know, and they said, well, you just can't. You have to like, you have to give some hope, you know. And I remember thinking that I just didn't, I wouldn't have wanted to do things exactly that same way. That I felt like there was a level of transparency that was missing from that experience. But I still, you know, I learned a lot and I just kept observing and stuff. And I ended up working alone the night he passed away. And it was interesting because he was bed bound up until that point and ended up, I I couldn't find him when I went to check his room. (laughs) So I was like, okay, like, uh, what happened? Beamed up? (laughs) Yeah. Like I had no clue what had happened. And by that point I had read a million books about the stages of dying. So I thought, oh no, maybe he had that energy burst. Maybe that's what happened. And, you know, he had all these other steps. Maybe that's where he's at. And I walked into like our main room. We had this like main hall room and he was standing at the front door. It was pouring rain and he was screaming outside the door that he saw a a friend of his and his wife who had passed away years before. And he was like, how are they here? They're gone. How are they here? And he was so confused and I mean, I don't think that I existed in his line of sight. <laughs> I just think that I was an object in the way. So he punched me in the face as oh, hard no. as he could to get me out of the way. And I was totally shocked and drenched because it was pouring rain and I had to get him inside. And I called Marie and she had to drive 45 minutes out to come out to see me. And um, it really escalated from there. He was rageful you know and terrified and excited and (laughs) he had all these emotions and eventually she got there and she gave him a medication um in his cheek and I was like well what's that gonna do and pretty much as soon as it hit him he sat down I would say it took seconds and she brought him into his bedroom and then uh called his wife and a couple hours later he passed away and it's crazy. It was crazy. It was. I mean, was, I've heard of the rally. I've heard of them seeing people that are deceased, mm-hmm. especially loved ones or pets. Yeah. But never a rally that is accompanied with rage. Oh, yeah. It was. Wow. And I think it was a combination of his his experience was so different. It was unique in the way that he was not ready to pass away. It wasn't it didn't feel like it was his time to him or his family. And I think that's where the rage came from. He felt like somebody was there to get him, to pick him up, and he wasn't ready to go. <laughs> and that's what, how, how he's describing it. It makes sense. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. And I want to yeah. go back to where you said that um, Marie, the nurse, mm-hmm. told his wife that it would be three months and that didn't really sit well with you. Mm-hmm. I, I get the wanting to give them a little bit of hope, but um, I would almost think that how long was it? Did he, was it a month or was it Three a little longer? Three weeks on the dot. Oof. Yeah. See, that would mm-hmm. feel really bad. Like I thought he was going to be around for three months and, and it's been three weeks. That would be really hard. So I think I agree with you on mm-hmm. the transparency. My dad passed away on hospice from kidney failure, which they generally say takes about two weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was just under two months. Right. <laughs> so, you know, so here's my sister thinking it's going to be about 10 to 14 days. And then we get to like day 15, 16, 21. And it was just weird and yeah. hard because you know, we had to have 24 hour caregivers for my mom. His um, he got really toxic, which mm-hmm. is what precipitated the kidney failure. Well, the kid, bad kidneys precipi- precipitated the toxicity in his brain. I mm-hmm. can speak. And so he thought it was 1998. So like overnight, I ended up with two parents with no brains. So mm. that was real fun. I had to, you know, get um, in-home care like yeah. in 24 hours because the hospital was done with him. It was just like, bleh. But, you know, it's like you get to a point where like I would leave my house, drive to the next town over, pick up his mother, and then we'd, you know, drive to his house and we'd all visit. And it was just like, you know, there was times when it's like, I do not want to pick up my grandmother because I need like my own space to like, you know, process what's going on. And after a while, it just felt like, you know, like I was just taking care of her and him and I couldn't take care of myself. It was just like, well, it was, mm-hmm. it was not fun. Although the hospice people were fantastic. So, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm a huge proponent of hospice because 
you know, they're there to support everybody. Right. The ones that do yeah, it right. Yeah, it's not just their resident they're working with. They're usually like just as, you know, involved with the families and the people that are being affected by it all. Caregivers as well. That's what I appreciated as a caregiver at the time. Why did your sister need a caregiver in the hospital? Was that a family kind of request or did the hospital actually so request that? It was kind of a combination. Um, she knew she was just going to need someone by her side through it. It was a really, really intense experience intense enough that she's in like textbooks now. Um, oh, wow. so it was very, very insane. And, um, a, and a lot happened in that time. So it was just easier to have somebody that could be there for everything and be at all the appointments. And she was not really coherent for a lot of it. Um, her cognition just wasn't quite there because of the medication she was on and things like that. So it was good to have like an advocate there for her and, also, it was a great bonding experience for us because we hated each other growing up. And <laughs> it really got very close. We're super close now. And, um, you know, it was it was great. But yeah, she kind of needed it. It was kind of all aspects. I think that the hospital wasn't comfortable and she wasn't comfortable and my family wasn't comfortable. So, OK, that makes sense because yeah. we all need an advocate when we're in the hospital. Mm -hmm. When my husband was in the hospital, I did most of it on the phone because the hospital is like 45 minutes away. And it was like, the surgeon's supposed to come talk to you about lunchtime. I was there at lunchtime. I waited and waited and waited. I'm like, I'm about ready to chew off my arm, starving, mm -hmm. but I'm going home. I'm like, as yeah. soon as I pull out of the parking lot, this, this you know, will show up. Um, so I had to do most of the stuff over the phone. But my husband's cognition was fine, but they, the hospital is just slammed. So yeah. they were they were in like literally the um post operative bay. I think they had like almost fifty beds, no windows, no privacy, one bathroom. Mm -hmm. And I just kept looking at the older adults, the senior citizens, and I thought, this is so terrible for their brain. Like mm -hmm. I was worried about my husband, but you know, he had his AirPods and he was watching stuff on his phone and listening right. to things. So it's like, but when the um physical therapist took him out in the hallway and it was like bright beaming sunlight. <laughs> It was like, he did not want to, he was like, no, we don't need to go back. I'm just going to stay here. And it's just, uh, hospitals are not the best place for us whatsoever. <laughs> They're not. And it's not a good place to actually get better. Um, you know, really, you want to heal at home. But it's also, sometimes you don't have the tools to do that there. That is true. So it, tell us exactly what an end-of-life doula does. Because this is, you, you're profession is not one that I've actually had any kind of connection to. So I'm mm -hmm. completely, clue not completely clueless, but mostly clueless. <laughs> so advocacy, advocacy is really like the biggest thing. Um, having somebody there to support you, to kind of guide you through the steps that are happening towards the end of your life. Um, for me, I do things like helping folks write up their advanced directives, helping people write out their wills. Um, it's interesting because the primary client that I get is actually new parents new parents, okay. they're freaking out. So they all want to start setting up plans because they're panicking. So I think it feels good to have something that is structured for them. Um, so kind of setting up a plan and putting a plan in motion. And contrary to death being in my title, I really enjoy life. And I'm like a super life enthusiast. I love life. And I just think that having a good relationship with knowing that you're going to die at the end of it helps you really enjoy the moments and kind of live with a little bit more freedom and a little less anxiety. At least it's helped me. So I try and kind of be that person for others. And then, um, I do everything from bedside sitting to, you know, visiting people in residencies or in homes if they need it. Um, getting in touch with funeral homes, helping you dress a body if you need that afterwards, like a little bit of everything. So what exactly do you do for new parents? Because I would not have thought those people would have been your client. I'm like a little bit shocked over here. <laughs> they all want to start writing up advanced directives uh, and okay. having some kind of, yeah, like, what are we going to do with our kids? What are we going to do with the house? What are we going to do with the car? What are we going to do with this and that and all these? <laughs> we did our estate planning when our daughter was, what, 29? So yeah. we didn't really have to worry about that. But because she has Crohn's disease, mm -hmm. so when we talked to our attorney, we had to have a lot of the Alzheimer's discussions because my maternal great grandmother had dementia. My maternal grandmother had vascular dementia. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So right. 
yeah, great family history. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, I do think I take more after my dad's side of the family, which is great, except for the obesity gene, but that's okay. I've got that under control. <laughs> I'd, rather, yeah. I'd rather have to fight that one than lose my mind. Totally. Um, but, you know, one of the questions he asked was, well, what happens if your daughter goes before you? And it was like, well, mm-hmm. that's an obnoxious question. And he goes, but I got to ask it. And I'm like, I don't have an answer for that. Now, she'd been with her now now husband, um, fiance at the time for, I don't know, forever, like seven and a half, eight years. And at first it was like, you know, he's the youngest of five, his family, he grew up poor. He's got some siblings that are a little sketchy yet. I mean, like just your brain is going thinking right. like all these negative things. If he inherit, you know, we give our money to him because she died first. And I'm like, one day I was coming down the stairs. I'm like, we'll be dead. Who cares? Mm-hmm. <laughs> just like, bam. Like, <laughs> And I told like, him, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'll be dead. I don't think I'll, you know, I said, if you like do stupid stuff, I promise to come back and haunt you. And he laughed. And that was the end of that discussion. Yeah. So it's like, you know, once you've made the decision, it's like, pff, okay, I don't you have do to stress about that. You do feel better about things. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you like approach it and it's like, you know, having to talk to the attorney mm-hmm. about, you know, like, well, if I get Alzheimer's, then we have to, like when my dad passed away, which, okay, irritation number one. He never planned what we would do with my mother if mm-hmm. he died first, which since he had diabetes and a kidney transplant, that was kind of likely. Right. He just assumed, without discussing it with me at all, that she would come live with me. Lovely. <clears throat> no, thank you. <laughs> right. I, I knew when he was in the hospital and she spent time at my house, she spent time at my sister's house, my aunt spent time with my mom in her own home, you know, my mom's home. Mm -hmm. I just knew I'm like, first off, I just turned 50. The daughter moved out a month before my dad died. I'm like, excuse me, but I'm not, I'm not giving up the next 15 years of my life. Yeah. You need some space. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, hello. Like, and I, we still work and we're self-employed. And it was just like, I know, I knew without any hesitation that at the end of a week, one or both of us would be dead. Like, this is not a good scenario. And as it turned out, she had friends in memory care. She did activities that she refused to do with me which drove me bananas, but at least she did them with somebody. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was actually really happy in memory care. So yeah, a lot of people are, it's more interactive and it like I long-term goals for me would be to have my own care facilities one day, specifically memory care facilities and end of life care facilities. And that's a huge part of it is like, I want that, the energy there. (laughs) I need, you know, I need that simulation. I want people to feel like they can interact with others. I have Big goals, big dreams. <laughs> but well, I know a caregiver who her mom is on hospice. Um, she's a teacher and she majored in sociology. So she's like mm-hmm. a real people observer kind of person. She's really smart. She keeps talking about how I need to have my own care agency and I need to teach this course. And it'll be really interesting to see where she goes after her mom is gone. She did not think yeah. her mom was her. I guess they recertified for hospice. She hasn't talked about it, but. They were supposed to get kicked off a of hospice earlier in yeah. November. And yeah, now we're graduate of, a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, her mom is still dying and she's talked about how hospice doesn't, um, they don't really understand the difference of dying with dementia versus dying from something else. And interestingly, and this is why I like to, you know, pay close attention to what's going on in her life is that they're black. Mm-hmm. And she said, one of the things that the um, hospice nurse said was like how good her mom's skin looked. And she's like, my mom's always had good skin. She's yeah. like, I think there's a cultural difference here. And I think she asked a question and I messaged her. I'm like, my mom died at 77. Her skin was crap. Yeah. <laughs> my mom's yeah. skin was not great. And I said, I do. Th- I think you, I think you're onto something. And it's like, I obviously would never, you know, probably most likely never experience that because I'm not black So, you know, I'm not Mm -hmm. planning on dying anytime soon. (laughs) So, you know, it's just, it's just interesting how, you know, there's like so many variables Mm -hmm. into all of this. And then dementia just adds just a humongous complex part. Yeah. And that's the thing, like I, I've ended up working in many facilities at this point. I couldn't even count, honestly. And I've sat with over a hundred people as they've passed away from all kinds of backgrounds, religious backgrounds, you know, cultural backgrounds, sexual backgrounds, everything. And I just always noticed there was a kind of a running theme that in certain areas, 
specifically care facilities, especially people who aren't their standard norm, it's like their needs get ignored. I had a resident who was Buddhist and strict Buddhist their whole life. Their children are Buddhist, like they practice Buddhism. And one of the rules of Buddhism is that somebody, nobody can help you into your death because um, you're not going to reach enlightenment. So I had to, it's very, it's a long, complex thing, and I'm not going to get too into it because I don't know enough about it to like pretend to educate. But it was really important to this person that we respect their wishes. And they were terrified that they were not going to reach enlightenment if we didn't. And I remember I had to like sit their whole care team down and like we had passed out books and pamphlets and their kids like wrote up stuff for us so that we could teach them. And, and they had a very peaceful death. And it was the hardest one though, because we weren't allowed in the room. So we just were like wondering what was happening the whole time. And then, Mm. you know, a month later I had another one where it was a very different situation where we had to be in there nonstop because we couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And she was screaming bloody murder and had a DNR and all of these things in place. So, you know, there's only so many things we can do. And it actually like kind of hit me one day. I sort of have, I joke sometimes that me and death have a good relationship. Like I had like a sixth sense, like a sixth sense or something that comes over me. I was laying in the bed with her and I was holding her because she was screaming and crying and I just wanted to comfort her and like hug her. So I was holding her and I randomly remembered that she had a daughter that she wasn't speaking to. Mm. And I was like, somebody call her, call her now. And we called her and she came in. And as soon as she walked in that door, the woman sat straight up and apologized to her. And oh, they had wow. this clear as day conversation. And she passed away that night with her daughter in the room. Wow. And it was just a very different experience. And I remember thinking like, everyone's death is so unique and we need to be paying attention to what they need. So then I started working in an area called custom care. So it's where you have people that are a little more complex, their situation is, or maybe their guardian is or whatever it is. And we have to like customize what we're doing for them. Like the Buddhist family. What was that? Like the Buddhist family. That definitely sounded like like, family. Like it was custom, but (laughs) Mm -hmm. maybe before your custom time. (laughs) Right. I've had a couple of clients too that are like, children or parents of celebrities their children are celebrities or something or one who his best friend is somebody wildly famous in history and he hated working with me because I'm white and I understand with the dementia he had the things that that was bringing up and oh man I remember having a really hard conversation with him in the shower one day (laughs) I was like, uh, unique unique place for a tough conversation. (laughs) You know, I, (laughs) it's going to sound weird, but it was a good place to get him because he was vulnerable. So that's like when your mom talks to you about stuff in the car that you're like, "Ah, like, I can't get get out. out. (laughs) (laughs) That must be a universal thing. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, Hey, while we're here. (laughs) That's funny. Yeah. Got to break the ice there. (laughs) See, I was not present when either of my parents died. My parents Mm -hmm. lived 20 miles away, and I was just not going to stay at my parents' house while my dad was on hospice because, you know, it was almost two months. I'm like, I could not have done that. I thought about it, but I'm like, I just can't do that. Even with the caregivers here, you know, there wasn't really a place to sleep, and it's just like, I don't want to be here, and... He yeah. would, he got really verbally abusive at the end, and so it was like, mm-hmm. no, thank you. I was lucky enough, the week before he died, I was there. He went down the hall to use the bathroom and came back. It took forever. And so he was standing up, so I managed to give him a hug and tell him I love him. So that was all good. Mm-hmm. And then my mom fell and broke her leg on March 8th, 2020. She was in the hospital until the 12th. She went back to the care home on the 12th. So I saw her the 12th, the 14th, and the 16th. Mm-hmm. They um, then the you know governor of California said all of the all of the towns in the all the counties in the San Francisco Bay Area are hereby under lockdown. So I mm-hmm. did not see her the last two weeks before she died. I did get to see her the day before, and thankfully for me, I've had dogs all my life, and I've had yeah. you know quite a number of them die, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And I walked in my mom's room and I was like, oh, yeah, this is not ending the way I expected it to. Because you don't really expect them to pass away because they broke their leg. Right. But that's pretty much what happened. You know, she 
just wasn't eating or drinking and she passed away within, let's say that was Monday morning. She passed away Tuesday right after lunch. You know, what's interesting about that though, is that people don't expect that, but that's actually, I, I just had a death in our family this week and an elderly family member passed away and it was due to a fall. And that is like, like a fall, a cold, that'll take somebody out. Those are Number one, when I see, you know, when I go into a care facility, if somebody's like, oh, yeah, she just broke her hip. Okay, then I'm we're counting time down at this point. Then like it's th- it's number one. I think if it had been her hip, I would have been slightly more prepared. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, this was at the time when everybody was like, WTF, this COVID thing, huh? What? Right. And I mean, the whole experience when my dad died, we had a huge funeral. I got cards and flowers and meals and just like tons of love pushed my way, which was nice. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a little overwhelming. My Mm -hmm. mom died. It was like, we're bringing you a meal. One person sent a card and that was it. It was like, okay. I mean, I'm not upset with anybody because like nobody knew what the hell was going on. It was just a very strange time. And I understand that. But sometimes when you think back, it's like, geez, you know, like Mm -hmm. didn't anybody care? It's just very strange. But yeah, if it had been a hip, because I'm I'm super familiar with frailty because I used to have a right. gerontologist talk quarterly on the show. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the things I asked her was about frailty. I forgot how that came about. But it's basically like your body just starts, you know, it can only take so many like hits to the health yeah. beater. And, you know, that's usually like the last straw. And that was what it was for my mom. And I mean, the, just- the reality of it is at a certain point, you know, we are living off of medications and not because our body wants us to. And that's Mm -hmm. just like a part of being, I I think, you know, I have a lot of theories about what that is, but I think that a big part of it is that we are all afraid to die and want to live the longest versions of our lives that we could possibly get out of it. And, and it's interesting, you know, I have a a woman that I care for and she actually just turned 110 a month ago. (laughs) Yeah. My my hundred and nine. Yeah. But she's, She's right there and, and not, she doesn't have any living relatives. She doesn't, not, nobody that knows her anymore. You know, mm-hmm. like I didn't know my great, great, great grandma. <laughs> so I'm sure she doesn't know anybody anymore. She lives in a place where they're actually not charging her anymore. Um, <laughs> that's a, that's a benefit. Yeah. They just don't know, you know, how long she's going to be around. And that's she so is crazy. not, she's interesting because she, is kind of still there. Um, I say kind of because your brain naturally deteriorates. So there's a lot of that that's happened, but she can still tell you stories and have conversations and she gets up and she doesn't get out of her wheelchair, but she wants to get up and go and participate in activities and things like that still, you know? So, so she's still living like literally living. Yeah. That's crazy. Definitely because we are making it happen. (laughs) Well, my paternal grandmother lived to 103. Mm -hmm. She wasn't really on any medications. She was mostly blind from from glaucoma. And then about 101, she got really profoundly hard of hearing, Mm -hmm. which was super frustrating because you had to like literally scream, like almost like you'd sit next to her and like rest your chin on her shoulder and just yell in her ear. It was like not fun. Yeah. Um, I don't like to like yell. And, you know, we'd be sitting outside on the deck. She eventually had to move into a board and care home, Mm -hmm. which I just learned over Thanksgiving that she she really liked it there, (laughs) which is very interesting because when trying to think what year it was, my daughter graduated from high school in 2009. So it was after that Mm because she was in college and my aunt basically threw up the white flag. So my aunt is the daughter in law. And said, I've been doing this for 20 plus years or 20 years. I'm done. Yeah, my, out. My, well, my grandmother was not, and this sounds terrible since she's gone, but she was not very respectful of my aunt's time. Mm-hmm. It was just like, family will do for family. Well, it's like, well, you could make this easier. Yeah. You know, it just, it was, it was very difficult. And so. And look, I do think that, I think that there is a level of responsibility that comes with being a family member. I do. Um, I though, however, also respect the fact that some people don't want to and don't have to take that on due to whatever feelings or experiences they've had with that person. There's people in my family that I will make sure are in a nice safe care facility one day 
so that my sisters don't have to deal with it. You know, there's people in my life that will move in with me when they're older so that I can take care of them so that my siblings don't have to do it. You know, there's, and it's just because I know. (laughs) So, and I don't want them to have to do that. Like there's, and also I think, you know, I used to hear that phrase like, oh, you know, some people are made for it. You were made for this. Like some people are cut out for it and some aren't. And I would get uncomfortable and I was like, everyone can do it. At this stage in my life now, I truly do appreciate that. I actually do think that there is people that just are made for being able to kind of check out and some that aren't. You know, I've had this experience even with caring for criminals at the end of their lives and knowing what's been going on, knowing what they have done, knowing that they've done horrific things, things that, you know, if it's interesting, like in any other situation, in theory, somebody would freak out about and I saw many people refuse to care for them and stuff but I just I don't know you know it that I don't know I just check out (laughs) that's really interesting I do think that there are some people that just I mean they could probably work their way up to being a decent caregiver but Mm -hmm. um, I had a recent episode called caregiving with love and joy and one of the standout comments that my guest made was that, you know, if you're not capable or willing to do this a hundred percent, then you need to find somebody else that can because Mm -hmm. your family member deserves a hundred percent. And I liked that because one of the things I hear a lot, you read a lot on social media is, Oh, it's, it's such a, um, what is the correct term? Um, it's such an honor to care for those who have cared for you and nobody has been able to tell me why exactly they think that. It's just one of those stupid memes that people put up that make them feel better, and I don't understand it because I did not feel honored taking care of my mom. She thought I was her best friend, so we didn't have any of that uh, more intimate family relationship because, you know, like if you think about how you are with, like, your mother or your spouse or your sister Mm -hmm. versus how you are with your best friend that was the difference. So there was always kind of that little bit of formality. And so, no, I didn't feel honored. Like I didn't feel burdened per se. I mean, Mm -hmm. there was a lot of challenges, but that was more the medical industry and just, you know, dementia in general. But it's like, it makes me crazy. It's like, please stop saying that because it makes some people feel really, really guilty because they are angry. Yeah. And honestly, (laughs) like there is some people that I feel honored to have gotten to work with. And there are some people that were shitheads. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry if I can't say that on here. That's fine. One one but, or two is okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that was just the reality. You know, there's a lot of people that I that passed away and there was a sigh of relief in the room. Hmm. And that's just it. That's just it. And, and honestly, that's a type of grief too. There's complex grief that occurs when people, when you lose an abuser or you lose somebody that you, you know, grew up with that bullied you or so, you know, whatever it may be that happened or somebody that maybe you didn't agree with politically or, and you're like, Oh, you know, heck yeah, that person's now gone, whatever it may be, you know, that's still valid. And those feelings are still valid and you should still be allowed to feel them. And I don't think that just because somebody is now gone or aging or whatever it is, you have to change your feelings about them. That makes sense. I mean, I miss my dad, but there are times I'm like still angry that he didn't, Mm -hmm. you know, he didn't, allow my sister and I to help care for our mom. Mm -hmm. Um, Even when we offered and tried to do things, we got rejected. So when he died, it was like, oh my God, holy, holy crap. (laughs) Yeah. She is way worse than I thought because he was a buffer. I mean, I knew she was bad, but when it was just the two of us, it was like worse than I thought. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I had no idea what to do. You know, you, you think you know what to do. And then all of a sudden you're thrust into it. You know, he assumed she'd come live with me. So I was like, you know, I'm like, I'm, I was just having this conversation with someone who just lost their mother and um, she's a little irritated with hospice, but I think it's just grief. You know, she's in that Mm -hmm. anger stage. And she said, um, did the hospice, she was asking on her Instagram story, did hospice um, provide grief counseling? I said, mine did both Mm -hmm. of them, but my mom died during the pandemic. So it was more like, we can talk on the phone if you want. I was like, no, go away. (laughs) It's like, I don't need you people. I have a, a, I'm in an Alzheimer's support group, so that's fine. Now I facilitate one. So, um, and I told her, I said, um, they had one and she's, you know, I said, yes, my hospice, both companies had one. And she said, um, what, what did they do? And I'm like, basically general grief counseling. And I said, the Alzheimer's association just recently, 
started an Alzheimer's grief support group. And you get to do that for two years. Because, of course, they started that, I believe, at the beginning of this year. So I was mm -hmm. like, I'd aged out of the two years before they even started it. <laughs> and I said, right. I think that would be better for you because the hospice group is not going to be able to deal with some of her other feelings. Like, you know, it was just her and her mom dealing with dementia. She had a really um, unique version of Alzheimer's, if I could say that correctly. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like, I'm glad the Alzheimer's Association has that because I don't like, I went to the one grief support group after, with the hospice company after my dad passed away. And I was like, well, I got to make everybody else feel better, but I feel like shit. So. Right. Because I'm like, yeah. well, I miss my dad, but I got this whole other problem over here to deal with that has nothing to do with grief, except it does, but it doesn't. It's very complicated. So very happy the Alzheimer's Association decided to, yeah, to do really that. Yeah, that's really cool. That's yeah, really just, nice. I harassed my chapter because I'm like, now you guys do that? Now that I'm like, you know, a month and a half shy of two years. <laughs> like I'm this like, deep into the grieving like, process now. Like, and <laughs> thanks. Do I, do I get any, do I get any, uh, like not bonus points, but do I get any credit for, you know, COVID being yeah. a problem? <laughs> well, I just also feel like two years is such a weird amount of time. Like I, I lost a friend in 2020, um, my best friend's sister, and it was <sighs> insane my whole 2020 felt like a dateline episode like everything that could go literally everything that could go wrong went wrong i have i can't explain it but we lost a friend we lost her and um it was crazy and a different type of trauma um entirely and then it was followed by a million hearings and trials and things like that and um her sister and I were just recently talking about how we've started to say things like, well, no one died today Oh, <laughs> to like make up for a bad day. And we were like, Oh well, man, that's bad. You know, or we'll say like, there's just little things that we're doing where we're noticing that grief is coming up. And she's like, I, she was, it's like, it was unacknowledged for like two years because she needed to power through this, this experience of like everything else that happens after you die. Like people don't even think about, you know, what happens to your car, your apartment your credit cards, your, you know, medical information, your debt, all of these many, all of your belongings. Do you have any pets? You know, were you in a relationship Were you guys, do you need to separate? Like there's so many things that are involved that your family ends up taking on after, especially if it was something you weren't expecting. So, you know, she was like, it, it's like now the grief is setting in the actual, you know, getting to sit in it and experience it and feel like, okay, whoa, did we just really have to go through all of that? And like, yeah, we're now at the two-year mark. <laughs> yeah, they probably, well, they just started it, I guess, what, in 20, 2020, 2021? Not mm -hmm. entirely certain. I just know I basically aged out by the time they, like, they started. Yeah. I, I would assume that for two years, you know, they can be a good help. But after two years, maybe you need something more substantial. Yeah, I think more so too. One-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. That would be my guess. I haven't quizzed them on the why it's two years. I, I kind of feel like two years is is reasonable for most people, but mm -hmm. it also depends. Losing my dad in 2017 and losing my mom during the pandemic, and then we lost a dog, and then we lost my grandmother. It's just like, bleh. Yeah. <laughs> like the last three years have been a little bit traumatic. I'm over it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was you. Or I was talk no, I was talking to somebody, and they're like, because the end of 2022, we're going to the Rose Bowl Parade, which has been a bucket item. This, awesome. this episode will come out after that. But, mm -hmm. um, so this gal I was talking to, she's like, Hey, that sounds great. She's like, maybe you're turning over a new leaf. I'm like, hell, it better be a new whole tree. You know, it's like <laughs> a new whole tree, <laughs> whole <Seriously tree>. <laughs> like a whole big sequoia tree of change, right. please. Cause it's just been, it's been a lot. You know, we moved to a new County. We're two hours away from my daughter. It's just been like a lot, yeah. but it's okay. You know, it's like, I'm strong enough that I am I've powered through some situations that are, have been challenging and I'm I'm glad that I can do that but there have been some yeah. times it's like yeah I wish my health health care company or whatever you want to call them had more care, you know mental health professionals because there are days when I mm -hmm. need to talk to one <laughs> yeah so you know I that's kind of how I feel it's like because I have some of the stuff that crops up when I have like a negative outburst it has it goes all the way back to childhood and I know that so it's like and eh, probably be helpful to talk to somebody if they had enough people to talk to <laughs> so right yeah so one of the things I wanted to ask and I know we have to be kind of delicate but last mm -hmm. week's guest Anna mm -hmm. worked with you 
which is why yes. I'm putting your guys' episodes together. So can you kind of walk us through without too many personal details of her, mm -hmm. like what exactly you did for her so people can get an idea of what what they could expect if they were to hire somebody like you? Because yeah, you, so you sound a lot like a hospice nurse. Do you replace a hospice company? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. No, not at all. Okay. I work alongside them usually. Okay. Yeah, we usually work like in cahoots together as best we can. <laughs> <laughs> I like but, that. Um, so with Anna, the situation was um, interesting because I'm sure she kind of explained like it was such a long-term experience for her. And when it came time where we were expecting um, her mom to pass, it was like, it was interesting because she was, I think because it had been going on for so long, people were giving her information that was hopeful, which as I said earlier in the episode, hospice tends to do. And um, honestly, for the most part, I spent time just kind of guiding her through the steps she was already taking and advocating for her when she needed it and explaining processes that she was already going through. Um, she's an awesome coach as well. So she's very well experienced and she kind of knows this, this routine already. Um, but you know, it's different when it's personal. So mm -hmm. the day that she called me was kind of the big day that I did my most work with her because she, um, just had a feeling, uh, her mom had things just seemed different. The whole room seemed different. She said she just seemed different. And when she asked, the nurses about it they said that um she'd probably be okay for a couple more days or like a couple more weeks even but she texted me and said you know could you come by and I happened to just be right in the area there so I mean I was in a meeting with another client um for like a grief thing so I told her okay well you know I have this amount of time but I could try to head there after can you FaceTime me really quick and I can give you a time frame of what you're looking at and she was like, okay, because she was thinking about going home. And I was like, well, let me just like look at her and see. So when she FaceTimed me, um, it was just, I saw all the signs that I needed to see. There's changes in your skin tone, changes in your breathing. Um, it's, it's like I said, it feels like a sixth sense sometimes goes off. Like I'm just like, oh, okay, yeah. So I told her to stay with her. And I said, I think you have maybe 30 minutes. These are what to look for. Um, so she sat with her and 32 minutes later, she texted me that her mom had passed. So it was pretty solidly timed out. Honestly, you know, I was a little bit like, okay, thank you for being on my side with that one. Cause I was kind of like, I hope that she doesn't, I don't know. I just didn't know what to expect if she was going to, you know, stick around with us for the next few hours and I was going to be able to get there in time. But then I just kind of guided her through the next steps who she needed to call. Um, who she, you know, how she needed to get her taken out of the area she was in and brought to where she needed to go to. She was taking her to a funeral home. Um, most funeral homes have mortuaries and all of that. Like it's, it's the whole experience. So you can go get embalming and everything in them. 
Um, not all of them have them. So, uh, you know, just be aware when you're making those decisions. Sometimes you're going to have to go a couple of places after you pass away before you make it to where you're settling in at. So I kind of just walked her through those steps a little bit. And, and, um, when I got there, just something I do personally is I try to give her it, I'm a little spiritual in a sense. So I tried to give her a chance to leave the room, um, her mom, a chance to leave the room. So I usually bring like flowers and some candles and just talk to them for a little bit and thank them for letting me be a part of their life and a part of their death in that sense as well. And then, um, you know, we just did a couple of little personal touches that Hannah asked for as well. And she went on with her day after that. And then, um, you know, a couple of days later was kind of the planning experience. And she, like I said, she's uh, the kind of woman and is the kind of woman that really knows her stuff and she knows how to take charge. And I think that can be really healing for her too. So she kind of planned out a really beautiful experience for her. And I just stayed in touch and made sure that she felt supported throughout the experience. And if she needed me at all, I would step in when she needed me. But, um, you know, she got through her day and we just continued talking through her grief a little bit and, you know, continue to now, but that was sort of the the extent of it. It was honestly a really peaceful experience with them. That's helpful to know. Like I said, I wasn't present for either of my parents passing. I mean, I, when I went and saw my mom the day before she died, you know, I had a minute where I was like, well, do I talk to her as her best friend or do I talk to her like the daughter? So I just basically mm -hmm. said, eh, you know, I don't really care what she remembers at this point. Mm -hmm. And so I just told her, you know, everybody's going to be fine. You did a great job, you know, bringing everybody up, even though I don't totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, mom doesn't need to hear my opinions at this point. <laughs> a little late for that. And, you know, I just kept talking to her and it was, it was hard. And then we... They called me. It was so funny. I talked to the hospice nurse in the morning. I had a podcast recording and then I went downstairs and had lunch. And just as I was finishing up lunch and I was like trying to do something with my nails because it'd been like six weeks since I'd gotten my nails done. So they were getting like just totally nasty. Mm -hmm. And so I end up at the, I end up at and that's like, like the worst feeling too, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, it finally got to the point where the acrylic had. I got all the acrylic off, but my nails uh -huh. were like sawtooth, and I'd wash my hair. I was like, oh, it was terrible. Oh yeah. And I, and I kept saying, I'm not going to complain that my hair is hanging in my eyes or my nails are all nasty because you know, like things could be so much worse. This is not something to complain about. But it was mm -hmm. getting really annoying. <laughs> but you know, I end so I show up and I'm like. You know, she was just laying there and it was, I don't know, there's part of me that regrets. I, I should have just left the memory with the day before, I think, but mm -hmm. I don't know. It was just weird. And I get that. I, and I think that's the case for some people. Like I, I've had so many experiences where the, my resident's child didn't want to come in and understandably, you know, it's, it's a different person at that point mm -hmm. that they're experiencing and that they're seeing. So and like, there's been a few times too, where, you know, their kids did come in and curse them out. Oh. <laughs> I was like, all right, you know, power, power to you, whatever you need to get it out of your system and go for it. And then after they leave, I'm kind of like, sorry about that. You good? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I like the yeah. hearing that because I'm glad I never felt the urge to do that. It was weird though. When the, yeah. the hot, let's see, was it, I think the, um, caregiving company called first to tell me my mm -hmm. dad had passed away. It was like 10, 20 at night. Mm -hmm. I am a total solar child. Like the sun yeah. goes down and I'm gone. You yeah. Know, it's just like, I hate winter because, you know, it's dark at five o'clock and I'm ready for bed. Oh my God. Pathetic. I get that. Like we're, we're, we're really extending our energy here tonight. <laughs> yeah, for real. But my husband's not home and you've mm -hmm. been really busy. So this worked out fine. I know. I appreciate you so much, really. <laughs> like I, it's been chaotic to say the least. <laughs> Oh, well, I guess that's good and bad. Yeah. Um, I, I talked to a guy during the pandemic who's in Israel and oh, he's wow. there 10 hours ahead of us. Yeah. So my little, I like late mornings to, you know, late afternoons, which is like pff, the middle of the night. And now I have one um, in January that we're recording. She's also in Israel. I don't know how I get hooked up with these Israeli people. They're American <laughs> expats in Israel. Yeah. And I had to actually adjust my schedule online so that she mm -hmm. could schedule. I'm like, okay, fine. But I've talked to people in the UK. They're like eight hours ahead. And sometimes I get all like dressed up on the top 
and then like yeah. workout clothes on the bottom and then we're done and I go do my workout and then I shower. <laughs> you know, whatever it works. You know, I just... swear, I looked much nicer before we got on the call. I was in like business. I was in meetings all day, like that kind of stuff. But I just was like, I need a sweater and <laughs> cozy for this. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Uh, the My YouTube channel is not huge yet, so we're good. It's like, I, I have to get over the like, oh, I hate it when my hair's like not freshly dried and looking all perfect. You know, I'm a retired portrait photographer. So it's like, oh, you're on camera. Oh, awesome. You want... You want to be like, oh, perfect. Like, I, yeah, there are people that do stuff on social media. It's like, I would never do anything like that because I I'm have like, a I hard guess time. I'm too vain. <laughs> I have such a hard time with my social media, which is hard because it's like a pretty big part of getting in clients and things like that. Actually, I'm very grateful. I, I work in a, the industry is pretty big. Like, a lot of, I do a lot of supportive living stuff, you know, things like that. So I get to meet a lot of people and that helps me find clients. So I haven't had to be super active on my social media, thankfully, but I know I could be doing better <laughs> if I was more active. I just have a really hard time with it. I'm not really one to like take photos all the time. I'm not really, I don't have the time to put energy into it. When I started it, I wasn't as busy. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have, it was in the pandemic and we weren't allowed in care facilities and things like that. So I just, it was easier to kind of, you know, get around it and do the social media thing. But now I'm just kind of like screwed. <laughs> so I don't really have the time for it. And I'll catch myself every once in a while. Like, oh, that, that'd be a good post. Put it in the notes. So I have yep. a notes full of great posts, but <laughs> not I'm, actually I've, happening. I've learned to do pretty, I like love it when I can do something in one take. It's like, yes, awesome. Yeah. Saved myself 10 minutes. You know, so that's just, but yeah, I'm really fussy. But anyway, so where mm -hmm. can people like learn more about end of life doulas and where can they learn about you if they're in the Pacific Northwest area? Cause obviously you're not going to be helping me anytime soon since I'm in Northern California. <laughs> Although if you want to get out of the rain, you'd be not... surprised a lot of the like <laughs> advanced directives and wills and things like that, that I've helped people write route in California. So it's, you know, I'm from out there. So I have a lot of family and friends and stuff from out there. So I think that's been mostly why, but um, yeah, uh, Amelia Nicolette, dot com is my website um at amelia death doula for my uh instagram and for the most part if you want to learn about death doulas you got to just google us and you're going to find all six of us on there <laughs> all six of you okay <laughs> no there's more now there's more now but it really was like for a long time it was like you know you, there's like a handful and that was kind of it although the other day um chris hemsworth came out mm -hmm. with a show on Disney and I'm not going to plug his show because you know he's not paying me but <laughs> in the last episode of it he hires a death doula and it was actually my teacher Alua Arthur and she was um she's the educator for going with grace which is the program I went through to get my certificate for my death doula and uh she's amazing I love her so much I learned so much about her and from her and it was really cool to see that so many people are hearing about us that now it's on TV like that. It's really interesting. I will say that's kind of what's been hard about keeping up with the social media thing. It's like some of these ladies have so much time on their hands. <laughs> like I, and there's so many more of them now. I'm like, oh my gosh, here you are and here you are. But, but it's well, also a really been, cool thing. It's necessary. I, well, yeah. I mean, I had hospice with both of my parents. Um, not really sure. I guess because for the most part, I am the youngest of my social group. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's kind of annoying, but especially as I'm getting older, it's like, ew, some of my friends are starting to get up there. In years. <laughs> like, yikes. <laughs> yeah. Like, you guys all better live as long as my paternal grandmother, because like, <laughs> hello, I just met you. Right. Um, you know, but, you know, it was like, my dad was in the hospital for 32 days, a friend of mine she mm -hmm. said, I don't even know how we got on the hospice conversation. And she said, well, my husband used X company and I used Y company and don't go with one or the other. I don't remember which one mm -hmm. they didn't like. So I, I went with the one that she recommended. They were great. And then when I called them at the start of the pandemic, we kept playing phone tag and it was like days. I'd leave, you know, they'd leave a message in the morning. And I'd call them back within an hour and it was just like a yeah. wreck, but I'm sure it was because of the pandemic. And mm -hmm. so I used the company that was kind of tied to the care home mom was in. And as far as I know, they did a really good job. They didn't mm -hmm. keep up with me. 
I'm 90% certain they didn't do all of the things they said they were going to do. But again, very beginning of the pandemic. So everybody was like running around trying to figure out what the hell, like what right. am I supposed to do? There, where there is no, there's no roadmap for this craziness. So I don't fault them. I just, you know, and the caregivers took good care of mom. So I do think though, like the, one of the best benefits of having a doula is having somebody to kind of be that bridge for you. Um, and sometimes conversations are just really hard to have. Like I've, I've had a few people just be like, Hey, I don't feel like they're being honest with me. Can you, can you get more out of them? How can I get more out of them? You know, or, or I don't think that they're giving me all the resources that they can be giving me. How can I request those? You know, that and, makes sense. And some people, it's just, it could be nerve wracking, especially when you're already in this like sad or depressed or stressed out headspace. Like, oh, now I have to add this other layer of, you know, requests or whatever it may be. So it could just be nice to have somebody kind of be the in-betweener for it. Um, little liaison work, you know? And yeah, just basically helpful. like somebody to hold your hand because it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's not, I mean, we have birth doulas and death doulas. I'm sure there's something in between. Oh, no, there are dementia doulas. I've had one of those mm-hmm. on the show. So it's like, yeah. okay, you know, it just, sometimes Honestly, it just needs. like a death doula is closest to a birth doula, in my opinion. Like we are, it's you, a death, there's a laboring experience that happens. There's this experience that happens after the death experiences where you're like sitting with the families, you're, you know, helping somebody grieve, whether, you know, whatever it may be, you're visiting in their home still, you know, it's, it's really similar in a lot of ways. And a lot of birth doulas become death doulas and vice versa. They end up getting both because it's, it really like, there's so much crossover. There's that same level of like magic <laughs> occurs still. It sounds a little, <laughs> sounds a little morbid, but really like death can be super cool and super beautiful. And it can be a really exciting experience for some people. And you know, you kind of got to honor that if that's what they want. You know, I had one lady who literally died while she was laughing. So it's like, you just kind of roll with it. But it's really similar. The doula, you know, the birth and the death for sure. I can see that. And I can see why people would do both. Mm -hmm. And it's, I would think, you know, I only had two parents and my all but one grandparent died when I was younger and, you know, raising my daughter and all that. So it's like, when my dad died, that was new. That was a new experience. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was 50. I mean, I guess I could have been older. You know, so then when it kind of came to my mom, it was like, okay. I mean, the hard part was not getting to see her, and that was very stressful. But, you know, but, like, I guess if I'd had, like, more grandparents die closer to my mm-hmm. parents, it would have been a little bit, like, I would have known more what to do. But I guess we got lucky because we know a lot of people. Like, my dad went to... Mm-hmm. funeral parlor that was owned by his friend. He was cremated. I'm 99% certain they didn't do it. I know they didn't do it there, but I didn't have to worry about all the transportation. Right. Like, and then the funniest thing is we couldn't find my dad's wedding ring after he died. <laughs> so I had to call up the funeral director and go, can you please go check and see if he's got it on him? Oh my God. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to go look, but you can go look. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like the, you know, I'm like, is that weird? But my sister was very stressed out. You know, he'd been in the hospital and he'd been home on hospice. Like, did it, yeah. did it disappear in the hospital? Did one of the caregivers take it? Cause we had a couple of caregivers we had to fire from, you know, tell the company mm-hmm. not to send them back, you know, and it wasn't like any kind of fancy band or anything. They got married in 62, but you know, it was important it's to her. Something. So I'm like, yeah, exactly. So it's like, okay, well, let me go yeah. ask if my dad's wearing the bed. <laughs> it was he was him? not. No, oh. and we never did find it. Oh, we looked wow. for it when we cleaned out the house. I have no idea where it went. Yeah. So, but it's like, you know, we had that kind of relationship that I could ask him that kind of question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I mean, I didn't, I felt a little weird about it, but not, not so weird that I was like, oh, never mind. I won't ask. Well, right. I mean, I'm, I know when they cremate them, I don't think the metal would have melted. I don't know. I don't want to no, think about that. No, usually, and they normally take all that kind of stuff off. So that's true. I have yeah. a metal plate on my collarbone and, that won't that I guess they have to take that out or that won't I don't know where that'll end up but yeah nowadays like my where my daughter and I want to be turned into trees but now we can I think starting in 2026 or 7 we could do uh-huh. human composting you can which sounds yeah, kind of gross list. yeah but it's like I'm kind it's of into beautiful. that I think it's really yeah. cool um have you ever looked up if you look up recompose life on Instagram 
um, Recompose Seattle is a composting, a human composting site up here. It's so cool. It is really a beautiful experience. They turn you into soil. It's not a super long experience and you can go home in a little pot with a tree and plant you somewhere. And it's better because, you know, a lot of people think that your ashes are like nutrients, but it's not, it's just ashes. So it's not really, you know, when you plant it in flowers and stuff like that, like you're really not doing anything for them. So the human composting is actually like a very realistic, natural way to get what you're trying to get out of that. I have a lot of family who we buried their ashes under trees and growing up, I was like, Oh, beautiful. Now they're a tree. But then I learned, I was like, Oh, now they probably just evaporated and blew away. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I became a little bit anti graveyard when mm -hmm. my paternal grandfather passed away in 97 and he was in a lead lined coffin in a cement lined hole in the ground. I'm like, this is not, I'm not religious, but this is not ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Right. Like, I don't know. He might still be there. Lord only knows. I don't want right. to think about that either, but it's For just me, like, it, it changed when I learned that in, it, well, I, I want to be donated. My body's going to get donated to science and kids can learn about me or whatever. But I do want, you know, one of the things that I want people to realize is that like, we're running out of space Mm -hmm. Like that's the a reality is that there's a lot of us and not a lot of land. Mm -hmm. And in most countries, you basically rent out a spot for 10 years. And, and then after that 10 years, you're thrown into the common space burial plot. <laughs> that doesn't um, sound nice. <laughs> yeah. Or you could rent out another 10 years. But like, is your family going to do that for you? Most likely not. You know, nobody really wants to pay the extra 10 years. They're going to just move your body to the common space. And that's very quickly what we're going to be doing here. Um, there's already like small islands where they're doing that. So I just think, you know, at a certain point, you got to find alternative routes, you know, <laughs> like or or be comfortable with being layered up because you're going to be that's what they're going to start doing is stacking <laughs> people most likely. Well, that's how my maternal grandparents are. They're in a like double layer yeah. um, grave. And mm -hmm. so, okay, this is my weird morbid. Th <laughs> this is the hospice team told me they really appreciated my morbid sense of humor. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, so grandma's on top for eternity. Alrighty <laughs> then, you know, it's just like, I, I mean, it's that. just weird. And there's like enough space so the youngest sibling, you know, the youngest of their kids, my aunt, yeah. can be cremated and stuck in there with them. Like, it just sounds all complicated. And yeah. you know, I'm here in California. We don't have enough homes and. We have these environmental laws and it's like, oh, the mm -hmm. hell with it. You know, I tell my family, if there's any working parts left, please donate them. Yeah, um, definitely. I, I plan on using That's them up. I'm you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to be like my grandmother, lived at least 103. That's another 46 yeah. years. Uh, if I can uh -huh. do math, 47 years. You um, got this. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I plan on using up the parts. But, hey, if anything's left that somebody can use, like, please Pass give it to them. them. I'm not going to yeah. use it. Um, I don't know about being donated to science. I might have to think on that one. I don't know that I'm that interesting, but you never know. It's just, but I like the human composting because I don't, it's just, it's like almost like a rebirth, which is kind of weird because again, I'm not yeah. religious. So it's just like, well, I'd rather. So one of the questions that we ask as doulas to try and figure out what people want, because sometimes that's a complex question. What do you want to do with your body after you die? And they're kind of like, oh God, you know, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. One of the things I ask is, do you think your body and your soul are the same? Like, do you think they're connected, you know? And for most people actually say yes. And I don't think they're connected. I have scoliosis. There's no way that the thing inside of me, that the me part would be down with choosing. You know, like I just, it's not the same. I don't think they're the same, but a lot of people do. And usually people who do believe they're connected won't want to be buried. They don't want their body to be destroyed like cremation or, you know, in some other way. Um, so typically if I ask that question and get that answer, then I know which direction we're going to start to lean. Um, and if they answer in a different way, then we can kind of open up different options. Yeah. I always feel like your soul is the energy that gets released into the ether to the environment, yeah. whatever. I'm yeah. like, I'm an artist and I have like, I photographed a family once who, had a child that died and they had a photograph mm -hmm. of him. We had the most beautiful sunset again, not religious, but I was like, Holy crap. I haven't had a sunset like this, like 
that I can recall. And right. I just had this like really strange abundance of creative energy. And I'm like, this is weird. Like this kid's energy is like surrounding my energy. And I'm like, yeah. when you die, your body just gives up and your energy goes out. You know, so if you believe in reincarnation, your energy goes somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think about it too much. Because like I said, I plan on being around for another 47 years. So. <laughs> right. You got time to contemplate later. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, she, you know, she she was fine except for the glaucoma for a long time. So, yeah, that's that's my it's plan. Been a, it's been a big topic in my house growing up in a weird sense uh, because my dad's an astronomer. So we always would go out and look at the stars and watch meteor showers. We have this humongous telescope that we call the Hubble because it takes up the whole yard. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's cool though. Cause he would tell us, Oh, one day my soul is going to leave earth after a while. It's going to go up to outer space and it's going to latch on to some orbit somewhere else. And I'm going to drive into another, you know, some other rock in the outer space world and become a planet. And I'm going to become a God. <laughs> and that's how okay. my dad thinks that he's going to be able to become part of the energy that creates a new planet one day, which, you know, it's just like his little goal, his little astronomer's goal. But I remember thinking growing up like, oh, OK, so that's what happens. Like you die and then your soul gets to kind of just like decide what it does next, you know, and and I don't necessarily think that now, but I like the idea and I liked being able to contemplate it growing up and having all these options because my mom is more religious actually so I had kind of a difference there and they never really made any of us kind of favor one or the other it was sort of just like a conversation was on the table at all times that's pretty cool I yeah, like the cool. idea of like your soul becoming part of the energy that creates a new planet that's pretty cool we have cool to think idea. on that one yeah I like yeah. that but my husband would be big on that he would like to be shot into space which if that's what he really wants, I'll do it. But I'm like, eh, there's enough crap up there. We really don't need to be sending more up there. But <laughs> right, I will honor his wishes because I'm a nice person. <laughs> so your website will definitely be linked in the show notes. And I will um, tell me the Instagram handle again. Um, at Amelia.DeathDoula. Amelia. I almost forgot Death it Dula. just now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will make sure to tag you in... The posts when this episode comes out, which will be af the week after Anna's comes out. We were talking awesome. about taboo topics of end of life, but it was yeah. about three and a half weeks after her mother passed. So it it would ramble on on other topics and then she'd bring it back. <laughs> and it was a really interesting conversation. And this one kind of helps tie it up. So this is great. Glad yeah. we finally managed to get connected. <laughs> I know. I'm so glad. Thank you so much for being so patient with me. I'm so glad I have a voice again. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> well, I appreciate this. And, you know, maybe we could do this again sometime. Yeah, definitely. It was nice chatting. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. <laughs>